Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Ward. Get started here. I've been building things for the internet uh, as a hobby since about 2005. In 2008, my hobby uh, I became my career. I transitioned from a career in, in athletic training and strength conditioning to a front-end developer, uh, in no small part due to a hobby app that I had called MyFitRx at the time. Um, it has served me well. It will actually serve as the live demo for, I'm gonna, it, for this presentation, actually a, a later iteration of it called Fitter Me. About the same time in 2008, I started, oops, getting ahead of myself apparently, I started dabbling in Ruby on Rails. Uh, over time, over maybe about five years, eventually transitioned to the dark side or the server side of the software development world, and I've been doing that ever since. I'm currently a software engineer three at Fish on the FishMe team at CoFence. Uh, FishMe was recently acquired by CoFence, so now the simulator project, uh, product, uh, which sends out uh, simulated phishing emails in, uh, on the corporate level, is now known as FishMe. And I'm here today to talk to you about GraphQL. Uh, we've recently made the, the decision to start using GraphQL in some of our uh, front-end projects and uh, microservices, and would like to share a little bit about that. So in this talk, we'll compare our existing API standard, REST, which has served us very, very well, to GraphQL. I'll introduce you to some of the basics of GraphQL, and we'll show you how GraphQL looks and, and how it feels in a, in a Rails application. And we'll discuss how to start uh, using GraphQL in your applications. And toward the end, we'll, we'll talk about uh, what we're doing on the FishMe team and, and how we plan on using GraphQL uh, moving forward. So REST, our current standard. It's, uh, it's served us very well like a, like a dark night on, on the wall. Anyone remember the, the dark days of chaotic wild APIs and Soap. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for the better part of two decades, REST has, has done us uh, very, very well. In essence, REST can be uh, distilled in, into four virtues. So uh, uniform interface, it's stateless, it has a clear separation between the client and the server, and it's cacheable. So as a uniform interface, what this basically means is that we always use HTTP verbs. Get, put, post, delete, you know them all well. Uh, we don't always use them correctly, but they're there. We always use URIs as our resources. And we always get an HTTP response and status, or HTTP response status, and a body back as a response. Stateless. Each request is self-descriptive, and it has enough context for the server to actually perform what it, whatever it's supposed to do. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Client-server separation. There's clear boundaries, uh, as it says. So basically, there's a contract. One entity has to, to serve the function, or has to be the entity that, that's doing the calling. Uh, the other, uh, being the client, uh, has to, to function as the entity making the requests. And it's cacheable. Unless noted otherwise, a client can cache any representation. This is possible thanks to the, to the, stateless, to the statelessness of the REST request. Uh, every rep representation is uh, very self-descriptive. But along with REST, and though it has served us very well, it, there's, there's some pain points that, that we see, mo more growing points than, than pain points. REST is rigid. As we already talked about, there's uh, five uh, resources that we'll generally use, uh, you know, using the, the different uh, HTTP verbs. So we're gonna use uh, get request for index, post request for create, uh, another get request for show, uh, patch update for uh, for updating and, and delete. This is great, but it it kind of ties us to a structure, and there's a lot of boilerplate with this. 
Which brings us to uh, why REST is rigid. Lots of boilerplate. While, while not exceedingly you know, difficult, uh, specifying, specifying all the URLs, all the routes, it, it becomes, a, you know, then you have all the controllers, it becomes tedious and, and time intensive, just monotonous boilerplate work. All the while we're making the assumptions that, that the data the client uh, interface actually needs, and they might not even use it. And you know what happens when, when we start making assumptions? So what we end up with is if we have to make a change in the design to our API, at best, it's a simple internal code update. If it's a public-facing face, API, which how many people in here work on public-facing APIs? You know, a, good, a good chunk of us. If we have to make a, a public-facing change, it's probably going to require a new version bump of our API. Uh, that gets expensive pretty fast. In many, case, in many cases, our server-side code is the most rigid part of our system, and it's considerably more difficult to change. This leads to a situation where we tend to implement our clients around the needs of our servers. And if you think about it, who should we put first in any of our projects? The end user, the client. So putting the server first, putting the server's needs above the client, that's, that's really bass backwards. Ideally, the server should exist to serve the client. It's in the name, right? Server. So it needs to be responsive to the changing requirements of the client. We all have product owners. Anybody get a new request last week? Yeah, it happens all the time. So, so requests come down, and we need to be, be able to respond to those requests very quickly. Rest is wasteful. Wasteful is probably a, a little bit of a, of a harsh term, but, but sometimes it gives us too little and we have to ask for more. That's under fetching. Sometimes it gives us too much and we have to ask, uh, and, well, it's over fetching and, and we're left with a pile of data that we really didn't ask for and need or we really don't need to use. Uh, both are less than, than desirable, you know, especially from a mobile device that may have limited network connection. So classic uh, case of underfetching. We have two REST requests. This is a simple blog post. We have the posts and we have the comments. Uh, for whatever reason, a request comes down and we need to display all the posts and all the comments. Don't ask me why, that just came down from the product owner. And so now we have to, to make a, another HTTP request to get a post's comments uh, for however we're displaying that on the page. So we're making essentially n plus one HTTP requests on the client side. Uh, not exactly the best case scenario. A real life example of this can be highlighted with uh, putting a toddler to bed. Anyone ever have to do that? So you know, I have a, I have a, a three year old son at home, he just turned three. And the bedtime process is exactly that, it's a process. So I'll, I'll put him to bed and you know, kiss him good night, and we start to walk out and close the door. Daddy, daddy, I'm thirsty. Oh, okay, son. So I go out. Tells me that he wants milk. I come back in with milk. He gets milk. Trying to, to leave again. Daddy, daddy, I need my my green blankie. Go out, get my green blankie. You see where this is going. Daddy, daddy, I need my teddy bear. And on it goes. So, lots of requests. So the next night. How do we solve that? I mean, that, that's the question. So how do we solve this problem for our product owners, and how do I as a parent solve it for my son? We overfetch. Simple way to do it, we cram the comment into the post and give them back everything. Here it all was. So the next night I put my son to bed, and I'm, I'm thinking that I have him beat. So I bring in the milk, I bring in the blankets, I bring in the teddy bear, I bring in a flask of Tula Mordu, Clearly, there's an authorization problem with, the, with my parenting endpoint here. But the, fear not, uh, if he tries to access the, the flask of Tulum or Dew, I'm, I'm sure that he will get an access denied. So, so overfetching. So that's a, that's a problem. So how do we, what are we left to do? This is obviously a problem. Well, a friend of mine offered a, 
a parenting advice. Uh, clearly, he doesn't have kids. Gives me a book. <laughs> Not exactly helpful, but you know, all solutions are on the table. So, <laughs> so but this is a, well, funny, it's slightly less helpful for, for our blog. So we might do something like this, uh, where, where we, we come up with a custom endpoint. Anyone have any custom endpoints in, in their application that, you know, it's, a, it, it's kind of a specialized endpoint for a, a more generic concept? Yeah, this is, this is how we kind of solve these. We, we come up with a custom endpoint. This is, you know, so now the, now the clients that need the posts and the comments, they can hit this endpoint. Well, this is a, this is, interesting for our REST application, because now we're, we're kind of uh, breaking our REST, REST contract. And as Nietzsche said, battle not with monsters lest you become a monster yourself. So our, our defender of the wild and chaotic APIs on the wall has, has now stared into the abyss, and the abyss has stared back, and now he's becoming what? You know, REST is becoming what, what, it's been, what it's been protecting us against. So this is a, basically our APIs are start to become harder to maintain, and we find ourselves loath to work on it, which is undesirable all around. Rest is laborious to document. I probably can just leave it at that slide. Uh, we all, we've all struggled with documentation uh, with REST APIs. It's often manual. It's probably going to require a markdown file, uh, maybe, maybe some JSON files uh, in the case of Swagger. Um, it's hard to ensure it's up to date. You make an API change, maybe you update the document, maybe you don't. Anyone come up with a, you know, ever run across the case where you try to use an endpoint and it doesn't work as expected? It's especially challenging for fast changing internal APIs. On the FishMe team, we've run into this with a, with a microservice where we had an internal, the internal API for the microservice was uh, changing very rapidly. And the UI would be continuously broken because we have to you know, readjust things. And those things don't necessarily translate to the documentation. Uh, but to give a good example of, of a REST API, I would refer you to Stripe's API. Um, anyone had the, the pleasure of working with, Stripe, with the Stripe API? Uh, probably one of the best documented and up-to-date um, examples that I, that I can come up with. I'm, I'm certain that there's others. So GraphQL, a new hope. GraphQL was developed by Facebook in response to, to these types of problems or, or issues with, with REST APIs. They wanted to improve the performance of, of their new native apps by fetching the exact data each view needed. Now, th this happened, I, th I believe, back in 2012. And, and they uh, ended up releasing the, the uh, public version of GraphQL in 2015. So they worked on it for, for quite a while and put a, a lot of good thought into it. Um, so the Facebook engineers, they also wanted to design an API where versioning and documentation were much easier. With GraphQL, there is no versioning, uh, which is uh, we'll talk about in the, in the live section. In short, they wanted to empower the client, which is something that we should all try to do is empowering our clients. And GraphQL does exactly that. So GraphQL defined, a query language for your API. Well, that's not exactly helpful. Um, but don't look at me, I didn't come up with it. This is straight from the uh, graphql.org website. So what does it mean exactly? Well, they offer a follow-up paragraph to that terse uh, definition. GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understand, understandable de description of the data in your API, it gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more, it makes it easier to evolve APIs over time, and, en and enables powerful developer tools. There's a lot of stuff happening there. It sounds very exciting. Uh, I still have no idea what GraphQL is. Um, so, <laughs> so with that, maybe we can get a better sense for, of what GraphQL is uh, by comparing it with our pain points of REST. So where, where, Graph, or where REST it was rigid, GraphQL is 
very flexible. In GraphQL, the client is in charge, as we've already said. The client specifies what data it needs, and the server only responds to what is necessary. So here's an example. Uh, here's an example of post to, to retrieve posts, their ID, and their title in GraphQL. So this, this query will actually return this response. Data post ID title. Pretty, pretty simple. So the, the query type that, uh, of post uh, and the shape that you give it is, is the exact response that you get back, which is very empowering you know, if, you're, if you're thinking of developing in an Angular app or Vue or, or React components. Uh, you know exactly what you're, you're getting back. Um, you know exactly what to expect. Uh, one thing to notice here is that all GraphQL requests go with one HTTP method, and that's post. And, and this is because you can create you know, long, complex uh, queries, and if you put, try to put that in a GET request, you're going to run out of, of URL max length very quickly. Uh, so in, in Rails, it's going to be a post request, and it will be parsed appropriately on the back end. GraphQL is, is frugal, so this goes along with what we just talked about. You get back exactly what, what you put into it. Uh, so if you want posts and ID and comments and author and body, you're going to get that back as well. So you, you get it back in exactly that shape. If you don't want the comments, leave out the comments. If you want the comments but uh, only the author, leave out the, the comments body. GraphQL is easy to document. Don't worry about the, the fuzziness of this slide. We'll, uh, this is a, a screenshot of uh, Graphical. It is the uh, query viewer, uh, UI viewer for GraphQL. And we'll explore this uh, here in just a second. But exceptionally easy to, to document. And, and what it, basically, GraphQL provides machine-readable <coughs> metadata that describes your API. That's a really fancy way of saying GraphQL is self-documenting and is browsable. Uh, and it makes discovering APIs nearly trivial. Uh, Front-end developers would have access to this, and everyone on the team you know, has access to, to the same documentation. Uh, all right, so now is where the rubber hits the road, I guess. And because of it, I lose my speaker notes, we go old school and use note cards. All right. That's pretty tiny, isn't it? All right. Let's uh, try to bump up my resolution. That a little bit better for people. I think that we can actually might make be able to make use of it. Okay. So for GraphQL, let's see if we have access to everything that we need here. So in a, in a Rails project, we start by adding the GraphQL gem. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're in a bundle install and a Rails generate GraphQL install, and that gives us the, the graphical uh, interface and everything that we need. Uh, basically, it adds this route to our dump file. This is our uh, graphical, graphical uh, route. It's the documentation viewer. Uh, it auto generates it behind the development environment, which is for security purposes. Uh, you can fur further um, lock that down. And then we have our post uh, graphical uh, endpoint. And so this is going to post to the GraphQL controller uh, and the execute action. Let's, I can, yes. How's that? And let me get rid of...
I can also lighten the screen or, or, or try to change the color scheme. Live demos, they say. Yeah, we get some here. Okay, so this is the GraphQL or the graphical uh, UI served from localhost uh, 3000. We just have uh, the FitterMe application running locally uh, and with the, the graphical endpoint. And so you can, you can read here as a, a little you know, blurb about what it is, but this is our documentation on, on our query type. So if we click this docs arrow over here, we can, and then get back all the way here, we see that, that we have a, a GraphQL schema provides a root type for each kind of operation. So with us, anytime that we're looking at, at fetching data, it's going to be a query type. Anytime that we're looking at uh, updating uh, or creating, updating, or deleting data, it's going to be a mutation type. Uh, I didn't think that I'd have enough time to, to talk about mutation types, so, so I just wanted to touch on that, but there won't be any examples of mutations. Um, I can click on query, and these are my, these are my initial query types. So, so when I say query type, let's go back to the code. Uh, what is, so we, we end up with a, a fitter me schema. So this is our schema file. This is our entry point into GraphQL. So we have our, our query and our mut mutation types. Um, inside, so this is in a directory called GraphQL where we have directories for mutations and types. So we're only going to be talking about types right now. So uh, keep in mind that, uh, that, that types just go in, goes into the types directory and then they're, they're auto-loaded. Um, so as we're talking about query types, so under the query type, this is, this is our, remember, our entry point into any type, anything that we want to fetch from, from a GraphQL. So we, if we want to see the circuits, so the circuit uh, in FitterMe is, is a circuit training workout. Uh, we can we can easily do that. So and we can look at that through our um, through the interface that we have circuits. Uh, so over here, and get rid of all, all of this mess. Whoops. Oh, of course, I closed room. So we get rid of all of that, and we can type in query. Gives us a little autocomplete here. And now, well, what do we have to play with? So we have circuits. OK, let's, uh, let's type in circuits. Uh, what's, so we know a collection of, ava of available circuits. OK, um, let's maybe pull the name of a circuit. And maybe we want to know the duration. Now we can run that query and there, there's the circuits. Uh, if we want to, if we decide that we want the image URL, well we know that that's there. Now we can run that and, and now we get an image URL. And we can take this and see that it, that it actually is an image URL that actually works if I had internet. Wah, wah. That's the joys of live coding demonstrations. Uh, so at any rate, so, so with this, we can explore and, and play with the, the shapes of the, of the data that we want. The nice, the, the really awesome thing about defining these types is it's really easy uh, to add new things and, and especially to to get away from the, the cumbersome REST responses. So as we, we take a look at, so as we take a look at uh, what a, an actual user looks like from the database, there's a lot going on there. If you look at the, the user model or person model or member model, uh, you know, whatever your current user model is and your Rails applications, it's probably pretty bloated. Um, and, and so don't, don't judge me too much. But uh, you know, knowing that it's bloated, you know, that's why we want to uh, return. You can uh, customize, you know, you can use custom serializers um, uh, to, to get a sparser return. Um, 
And then if we look into the, the circuits, so the circuit, you know, that's, that's even, even more so. So we, get, we, have, we have the name, the duration in seconds, uh, some difficulty, and then it has uh, this, this hash of exactly what, uh, what the workout entails and how to do it. And that's a lot of data coming back if we only need uh, maybe a picture and uh, workout name. So if we're, if we're wanting to implement that here, uh, you know, so say, you know, as a, you know, I want, I want to grab a user with an ID of one, mainly because I know that's me. Uh, I'll take the, well, I can have a full name, so I'll do a full name and an email address. I don't have workouts defined yet. And if I try to run that, I'll get an error. And it'll tell me exactly why. Uh, so what we can do, I already have a user circuit type. And because I was a chicken, I didn't want to actually live code. I just uh, commented things out. And so we'll go ahead and uncomment uh, this worker's field. And I'll walk through the, what the code is doing here. It's a, I'm giving it a custom name because I don't actually have a, uh, an attribute in, in the model called workouts. So it's going to be workouts. It's going to be a, of types, user circuit type, and that is defined right here. So this is a, uh, a GraphQL type. Um, and so the description is going to be completed workouts by user. So this is for the documentation. That's, that's where we get uh, this pretty stuff over here. So the duration, uh, that's all supplied by the description that, that you supply. And you also know, uh, while I'm here, we have deprecated fields. This is how easy it is to, to deprecate something. So I used to have an, an OG image URL, uh, and that is defined in the, in the circuit type. Uh, so this, uh, this OG image URL uh, is the promotional image for the workout. It's using the same property up here, but we don't want to use OG image URL anymore. We only want to use image URL. So we, could, we put a, a deprecation reason in. And, and now any clients that are using that, or, or more importantly, any future clients that are exploring the API, can see that OG image URL is deprecated and will likely be, re be removed at some point in the future, so not to use that. And it tells them what, uh, what alternative to use you know, to, get, uh, to be in compliance. Um, so again, living documentation is, is a wonderful thing. So going back to, to adding the workouts, uh, uh, to the user type. Um, I'm using a, a Draper decorator here, so you know, this, this code is really not all that important. Now all that we're doing here is, is pulling the user circuits, uh, using an, an includes to get rid of uh, an n plus one constraint or a concern. There's a couple of different GraphQL gems. Uh, uh, there's one in particular by Shopify that I would highly recommend that does batch requests that also mitigate uh, n plus one concerns. Uh, so we'll go ahead and save that. And then, I don't think that that is using, yep, and then we'll need to undo the image URL there. And now, refreshing that, we should be able to use uh, workouts. And the workouts, we know that it's a, a user circuit. Uh, you know, so we can come over here and go to user circuit to see what attributes uh, or properties we have available to us. And we have a name, so we'll go name. And we want maybe the image URL and we'll throw a duration in as well. And it'll be that. And so what, the, what that does it takes this view, and instead of uh, rendering the server side, now we can, uh, you know, use a view component or a graph or a React component or you know your uh, JavaScript flavor of the day, and and build this component with GraphQL. And if things and and only getting back the, the data that the the view actually needs to render and nothing else. Um, And I believe that is everything that I wanted to show from a live demo standpoint. So now let's see if we can 
enter back into the slideshow here. Maybe. Ah, and it picks right back up. Nice. OK. So live coding complete. I think by now we can all agree that GraphQL is, is interesting, but we may not know, or maybe interesting is interesting. It's at least intriguing. But before we dive in head first, let's, let's take a step back and, and spitball some questions. Where do we start? You know, do we have to re rewrite everything? What about production? Do we need a graph database? Because it's in, in the name. And too long didn't read. The answer to most of those questions is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about where, where we can start. Uh, the other questions, um, you know, the answer is no. And so let's, let's ask a, a fundamental question. Is, is GraphQL really all that different than, than what we're already doing? You know, it's, it's usually presented in, in a way that's a totally different way of thinking. You know, you have to think in graphs and reimagine your application. And it's using some of these buzzwordy things that I, that I think actually uh, are more harmful to GraphQL than, than anything else. Um, in practice, graph, GraphQL is just a standardization of things that we're already doing. It's similar to REST. It's, a, it's another specification. Uh, it could be used alongside REST. It could be used as a thin layer on top of REST. So you don't need to rewrite any of your existing uh, REST APIs. You can integrate uh, GraphQL into your Rails application and use it as a thin layer on top of your existing internal APIs or uh, uh, third-party APIs. So GraphQL adoption and integration. So we've already explored you know, how, how GraphQL can quickly be integrated into a, a legacy Rails application. But let's, let's set that implementation, you know, the technical implementation aside for a second. And, and let's talk about the soft, the, the people organization uh, hurdles that you'd have to overcome. So where do we start? How do we get buy-in from our teams, from our organization, from our managers? Well, what we're doing at FishMe is we're we're starting with one component. Where it's a, for us, it's a, it's a bigger component, but you start with one component. You implement GraphQL into your Rails application. You use it to talk to your existing REST APIs so that you're not rewriting a whole bunch of code. And you take that one component and you deliver it all the way to, to production. Uh, there's no need for a graph database. Um, the, the query, you know, you're already running queries. If, if your queries are already inefficient, you've already got another problem. So it's, GraphQL isn't going to necessarily highlight or um, uh, you know, create more problems on top of bad queries. And I guess you know, going back to that, uh, with, with integration, uh, incremental adoption is the, is the key. You, know, you think about any, any technology that, that's really taken fire and taken hold, uh, be it React, uh, especially true with React, um, and now uh, you know, more recently Vue. But if you can't inc incrementally adopt it, just drop it in, you know, create something without a, a lot of overhead, it's probably not going to take off. So GraphQL can be adopted in, in the same way uh, in your applications. So GraphQL first workflow. So as you're developing this one component, Design your schema first. So the schema is, is those GraphQL types, you know, that post type, that query type, uh, and, and use that schema as a contract between your front end and your server. Because now, with that GraphQL schema, you can hand it off to, to both teams if, if they're separated and create different, uh, you can uh, develop the back end and the, the client view side in parallel. Uh, there's great uh, mocking libraries so that the, the front end can you know, load in a, a GraphQL schema and get live responses back without the need for, for an actual working back end server. And then you can come together and uh, marry those two at, you know, at the end of the project. Uh, great talk um, that, that talks exactly about this and goes into far more depth than I will is navigating your transition to GraphQL, GraphQL by Sashko and uh, Danielle from uh, the Apollo team. Uh, would highly recommend that. Uh, 
So final thoughts. What abilities do you have? So, so as we're thinking about client and, and user joy, what abilities do you have to improve client experience and developer experience? You think about those. And then how will, how will you respond with that ability? How will you respond with your responsibility? Response and ability. Embrace your responsibility, be kind, do great things, and continually building great things. And thank you very much.